Welcome to the Dr. Leadership Podcast, where the DR stands for Driving Results. Our focus is weekly conversations around life and business relationships and the important leadership qualities for both. These concepts and qualities will help you drive positive results in both your business and personal lives. A weekly connection point to help business leaders develop individual contributors, managers, and executives on your teams. We also will tie in concepts around family focus and life lessons to help you drive success in your personal life. Welcome to the Dr. Leadership Show. Let's get after it. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Dr. Leadership Podcast. Absolutely beautiful weekend going on here when I'm recording this one. I want to jump right into it this week because uh, I may run a little longer than my 30, 35 minutes because I've got a lot to say about this uh, this particular uh, topic. You know, I started going into kind of the initial steps of selling, uh, talking about prospecting last week, and I'm, I'm saw a couple articles and a couple of studies and it just said, you know what, I got to pause that for a minute because I got to get this off my chest. I'm losing sleep over it. And what I want to talk about today is America's enthusiasm problem towards opportunity. And what I mean by that is we got a lot of people over the last three years that just have the doldrums and the woe is me. And our current state psychologically especially our young to middle-aged people, is in absolute shambles. And I'm going to go into greater detail about this, but the victimhood state that we now live in is the new norm. Everything is too hard. Everything is, I am not responsible for my current situation. It is a very big challenge for our society that we have to dig out of. And I want to talk about a couple of studies and a couple of things I saw on this And it's going to meander a little bit, but I'm bringing it home on why I think some of this stuff is happening. But I want to jump into the first first article that I was reading, and I'm just like, you have got to be kidding me. And Gen Z and millennials, uh, uh, before I talk about the study, I was probably, no, not probably, I was guilty of this when my kids were real young too. Gen Z and millennials, my kids' age, we kind of got into this coddling effect. You know, it was all about use a timeout versus any type of, you know, spanking. And I'm not advocating for spanking or anything. Keep the the emails to yourself on that, please. But we got really, really soft. We, We lowered our expectations of our kids. We've lowered our expectations of ourselves as we became young adults. Our parents didn't hold us accountable to start giving back and learning skills that would help you not be in the psychological state you are right now. COVID was very, very awful, right? It it is a a period in time that none of us will ever forget. Overreaction in a lot of means, lost a lot of people, terrible situation. The world was hampered by it. You can wrap your own mindset around lab leak or naturally happening. I've got my, uh, I've got my, Uh, mind made up on that based on data, not emotion, but it was awful. But it's now time (laughs) to, as the village, as parents, as friends, as aunts, as uncles, to drive people back to the value of work ethic and hard work and what it takes to be successful in this world. Here's the study I read. It was the first paragraph. Recent poll shows 35% of millennials are having some or all of their bills paid by their parents. What? First thing, I, huh? There's no way. 35%. Parents of these generations are trying, to, they're in their twilights of their career. <clears throat> they are preparing for retirement. And we've got a bunch of, not all, but we have created this psyche of sitting on your tailpipe, playing video games or woe is me or not actively searching. If you don't have a job right now, shame on you. There are millions available. Of course, as a parent, we're there to help. As a family, 
We're there to help people that have needs. But with jobs available everywhere, if you still have kids in your basement, if you still have loved ones that aren't working, you're enabling that lazy behavior or you are accepting it. That is not good. The next comment in this study was 63% of millennials and Gen Z generations <laughs> say they're burned out. So when you look at that, that is the 100% of the group. 63% are burnout. So anybody that's working or burnout, are you kidding me? Life's hard. That's exactly the, the other percent on top of the 35% that are having their parents support them. This is crazy, folks. We cannot be in a society where, hey, work is hard. I don't enjoy my job every day. I've been working in some manner, and I'm not saying I'm the hero here, but I've been working in some manner for 45 years. Started at 10, before that had chores at home. Make your bed, clean your bathroom, help dad with the yard, grab the end of a rake, you know, go out, pretend mow. I had a play mower, right? You pushed around and it pop, 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 made this sound. You were learning the skills that you were going to be responsible for. But I've been working for 45 years holistically, 33 in corporate America. Am I tired some days? You're damn right. That's natural. Life is hard. Choose your hard. Remember, I've discussed that before. Sitting on your bung playing video games is hard. You got to get up and choose to do that. It's hard to make yourself accept that that is how you're going through life. Life is hard. I'll give you an example of what good looks like, and it's an unfortunate good. I've got a dear friend, somebody I work with, last year fought cancer, thought we were through it. Last week, he's not through it. It's back, different spot. We don't know what he's, what he's fighting yet. He called me last night to say he was taking a leave of absence, with some, uh, a short-term step away to get this thing figured out so he can recover as quickly as possible and his words and get back to work. That's a hero. That is a leader. That is someone that embraces challenges. That is someone that understands life is hard. Man, I was impressed with that. I just I sat there and I wrote some more notes. That wasn't in my original conversation here. I got the call last night and I go, I got to add that into this. Think of that. I don't know how I'd respond to uh, to cancer. I hope I never have to respond to that for my loved ones or myself. Law of averages, we all are going to have to face it. We all face serious things that are legitimate reasons why we maybe can no longer work or we maybe have to take some time off, or we maybe need support of family. That's not what I'm talking about. When it is 35% and 65% and numbers of this uh, nature and this size, this isn't the exception. This is becoming the rule. Another study, 7 million men aged 25 to 54 are not in the workplace right now. And not only not working, they're not looking for work. What? There's 11 million jobs available in the trades right now. Don't require a college education. If you have a college education, millions and millions of those jobs pay over six figures. Go into the, uh, into the trades. I've talked about this before. Plumbers, electrician, framers, six-figure jobs, stonemasons, repairmen and women, for refrigeration, and for electronics. You can get a, a one-year electronics degree and be making $70,000 a year in 24 months. But instead, we're sitting down and we want to play level four of Galactica or some something. I, I don't know. I don't get it. And the reason I bring up video games is in that study, that same demographic, men aged 25 to 54 that are not working, in the survey stated... <laughs> They spend 2,000 hours annually in front of their screens, texting, TikTok, or video games. A full-time job is 2,080 hours. And you get 
two or three weeks of vacation. They're within one week of a full-time job sitting on their duff. Woe is me not engaging the workforce. We cannot be a healthy or successful society without working. This is why I call this episode the enthusiasm problem for opportunity. As an adult, if you aren't going to college, that's 19. We'll say you turned 18 in school. You take that summer off before everybody heads off that is going to college. You have a great time. I enjoy having a good time. I enjoy vacations as well as anybody. But you've got to have some self-worth in your mind. So we need to be self-sufficient if we're single or sufficient together as a couple once we reach adulthood. 7,000 generations, based on uh, people uh, have been on this uh, walking on this world for 180,000 years, that number moves around, right? Have we been here, has man been around for 100,000 years? It used to be 80,000 years. First it was uh, seven, 8,000 years, right? Before Egyptian times, the pyramids was really the beginning of modern time, Mesopotamia, those types of things. We're finding skeletons and remains all the time. Today we think it's 180,000 years. Look it up, really interesting topic. My point here is, is for 7,000 generations, people have been self-sufficient before these generations today. What in the world makes this generation think they're special or different? I don't, I don't get it. I don't get it. How someone cannot be enthusiastic for an opportunity that is going to pre- uh, present to them the means for successful steps in life like Supporting a family, buying a home, going on vacation, seeing the world, traveling. Remember, money isn't everything. Money is not the means to your happiness, but it provides the freedom to pursue your happiness. And how you get money is not from mom and dad once you're 18, 19 years old, if you aren't going to college. If you're going to college, there may be support systems in place there. I supported my kids through their college education. I felt it was important to pay for that. They were also responsible for part of that themselves. Very proud of them because of that. I did that on purpose. You need to step up and have skin in the game. We paid for three, you pay for one. They also had to have jobs during school. Spending money's on you. We'll handle the rent. We'll handle the living expenses. We'll handle the the curriculum and the uh, actual schooling itself. You got to go out and you got to take care of your fun money. But we got people just sitting around now and think that it's okay. The pandemic is over. Doesn't matter who says what. It's over. I'm out in the streets every single day. I'm traveling. Airplanes are full. 11 million jobs open. Go grab one. And what I start thinking is, how in the world did we get here? And I think some of it I already mentioned before. Coddling of parents and the psychologist's involvement and psychology is wonderful. I'm using psychology all the time. But I think we made a, the pendulum swung too far. How many times, I was in the grocery store. How many times have you seen this? This was about, this was probably six months ago. And there was a mother there with her hands full with two kids. But these kids weren't two and three. These kids were like five and seven. And the five-year-old little girl was having a, a meltdown is an understatement a volcanic eruption of a meltdown in the aisle checking out because her mom would not buy her a candy bar. And when I say she was melting down, everybody in the supermarket was watching this. And it didn't last for five seconds. She had a full cart of groceries. It was for 10 minutes. I'm sitting there and the hair on the back of my neck starting to stand up. And it's like, take control, take control. She's going, we're not getting any candy today. About the fifth time she said that, the child needed to have some repercussions immediately. I would have turned to the checkout lady and said, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to come back and do this later. I apologize. And I'd have walked that child out, put him in the car, driven him home, major repercussions, loss of something for the next week, no friends over, no video game time, whatever, to position that that doesn't happen again. But instead we coddle. We want to be friends instead of parents. I had a a, a saying with my kids, and I didn't do everything right as a parent, but this coddling, I was really good at not doing. I used to say, I'm your father, not your friend. 
I am responsible, my wife and I said, we are responsible for 25 and alive. It's on you after that. And that takes daily interactions, correcting of behaviors, setting expectations. And one of those expectations is you get a damn job. When you're 15, 16, you work. That's what it's going to take. Now I'm working with my wife and I on investments and how do you save to have yourself self-sufficient once you retire. These are all steps through life. The other thing I blame is the press and the news. I blame them a lot, and this is all press. The world is always ending. Chicken Little is all over the news every night. Every story is uh, is portrayed from a negative aspect. Every story is amplified. Let's talk about the rainstorms in California in December and early January. Atmospheric river events. We called them heavy rains when I was growing up. Northern California had a lot of rain with some localized flooding has happened every year for millennium after millennium after millennium. For 7,000 generations, heavy rains and flooding have happened. Why do you think civilization started in Mesopotamia and along the Nile, along the Amazon, along big rivers everywhere? The flooding produced very fertile soil, so we could grow food and survive. This has happened forever. Is man having impacts? I'm sure we are. Is it so much that it is changing the world and the world is ending in five years? I particularly don't believe so. My only point here is, is that the press continuously, continuously say that the world is ending. We have kids today that are 20 years old, 24 years old, that say they're not going to have children. Why would I have children? The world is ending. We are not going to be here in 25 years. I'm not going to bring a child into this. Really? Let's say that the seas rise all the way up. Every ice, piece of ice in the world melts. Actually, it can't be every piece because anything that is a floating iceberg is already displaced the seas. There is no impact on that melting ice. Let's say Antarctica, the Greenland sheet, North American sheet, let's say those melt away. Okay, you got to move everything inland five miles, three miles. That isn't the end of the world. It changes where we can live. It doesn't end the world. I moved back to the Midwest in 2020. There was a very, very high wind storm that hit Iowa. It was called a derecho. The press said, unprecedented, has never happened before. You know what my comment was? Why is there a word for it? (laughs) Never happened before, we just happen to have this word. It's called a derecho. So I... I looked it up. Come on, man. You want to know where derecho comes from? Dr. Gustavus Heinrichs from the the University of Iowa coined the term in 1888 because there was a terrible straight-line windstorm in 1877 that caused significant damage across the Midwest. He put this, and it was put from his definition and creation of the word derecho, into the American Meteorological Association Journal. This is long before effects of Industrial Revolution would have had its lasting effects. This is long before we had any automobiles putting uh, CO2 into the atmosphere. This is long before we had all of the uh, spray cans and all of the things free on all of the different things that we've had to change in our lives for the better to protect our environment. This is long before any of those impacts were happening. Derecho has been around that long. The only reason the word derecho is a word is because we needed a differentiation between straight line wind storms and rotation storms that we call tornadoes. 
another comment all the time is, there are more tornadoes than ever before. No, there aren't. I went and looked it up. I suggest you to do it too. Now, you look at tornadoes from 1950 to today, the chart goes up every year, every decade. It's a 10-year uh, pictorial representation of storms. So you have the 50s, and there's 10 bars, and you have the 60s, there's 10 bars, and it goes up and down every year, but it is gradually going up. You know why? Every generation from the 60s on, I grew up in the 70s, late 70s, early 80s, every news channel was in this battle for better weather forecasting because tornadoes killed people. So it was always Channel 8 with the newest Doppler radar available. And then it was with our new Super Doppler. And then five years later, Super Duper Doppler. The reason there are more tornadoes on the books is because we don't have to visibly see them now. We can look at radar imagery, and as soon as we see rotation on the radar image, they mark in the books we've had a tornado. We didn't have any of those capabilities. Remember, simplistic radar, 1942, 1941, saved the Battle of Britain, but that was just sending mass waves out. This wasn't about weather. We didn't get into meteorological understanding of any aspect until the late 70s. That's when we really started to study it. So the reason there's more tornadoes on the books is because we now mark them down when the, the, when the radar shows an orange and red convening. That means there's rotation. In the 50s, you only mark tornadoes down because it was caused destruction in town or someone happened to see it that then called in and or wrote in and said, I physically saw one. They say hurricanes are more destructive. Again, negative. The world's ending. Everything's down. That's why you end up sitting in your basement of your folks' house playing video games. Why should I go get a, a job? The world's ending. Hurricanes are only getting more destructive because of the population changes. The articles don't say that. And I blame the press because we have got this funk in our, in our world's minds that everything is half empty. The glass is half empty. We're all dying. The world's going to end. It's not. The world is changing. It's been going on forever. There's a couple, uh, three lakes in northwest Iowa that are the furthest south glacier lakes in the United States. It's the Okaboji Lakes. Glaciers were there. You go uh, 15, 20,000 years before that, Iowa was a rainforest. Europe was Amazon-like. 30,000 years ago. We have changes happening. Wobble of the earth, angle toward the sun, polar switches, north and south pole. The north pole is not true north. It moves a degree, changes weather patterns. These things happen. Earth's oceans, warm and cool, different areas on the globe cause different weather patterns. They say that, that, that uh, hurricanes are more destructive. What they don't tell you are things like this. So Katrina in 2005 was about 60 billion, I think the, the final number was 50, 60 billion dollars in damages. First of all, you have a society that lives in a bowl below sea level on the, on the, on the coast of the ocean, destined for problems, okay? Today, the dollars with inflation Let's call it $100, $120 billion. Katrina was awful. Lots of deaths, mass destruction. But they say that it's the worst ever, never precedented, right? The storms come over and over again. Last year was a good hurricane year. Didn't have anything until uh, November, had a bad storm. Two years before that was a bad year. Three years before that, zero hit the U.S. coast. In 1926, a hurricane hit Miami. This is why data is important. That storm in 1926 caused very little damage because there were only 30,000 people living in what is today Miami. There was only 600,000 families in all of the state of Florida in those days. We were still heavily northeast populated, and we started moving west. That southeast area was tough for us. It was miserable in the summer. Lots of bugs. 
we had to have uh, technology hit. But that 1926 storm, if it hit today, according to lots of studies, easily available to find online, 1926 Miami hurricane, okay? That storm would cause $320 billion in damage. The storm is not any worse than what it was in 1926. The press would portray it as the the world's ending. The storms are getting worse. The storms are not getting worse. We now have 15 million, 20, 30 million people living in the path where there was 30,000 before. They all have cars. Every car costs 50,000. Lots of Lamborghinis in Miami and South Beach. Lots of Bentleys. High-rise condos. Yachts. It's on the coast. Miami Boat Show, Fort Lauderdale Boat, Fort Lauderdale Boat Show every year. Hundreds of millions of dollars worth of boats. Billions of dollars worth of boats. 20 million people have to be housed there. That's why it's worse. It's not the storms are stronger. Are they coming a little more often? I don't know. I can't trust any of, this, any of the commentary because it's always the worst possible. So how do we dig ourselves out of this mindset? tell you how you do it. I found, I found this study. There's an 84-year-old Harvard uh, University study that followed 700 people and their families over the last 84 years. So generational through, right? The family they followed, the, the parents have now become uh, the grandparents and the great-grandparents and the kids and the grandkids are now adults, 84 years worth, 700 families. The happiest of those families and their feedback on why they were happy and what their lives were like was it was all about positive relationships with others. It was all about making friends with others. It was all about don't carry the doldrums with you. Don't sit in your basement. Go out and embrace life. Work. Make friends. They had seven, eight, nine points that they said were important on this relationship finding. The first one was look at the relationships every year. We've talked about this when I when we covered guardrails months ago now. Look at your relationships every year and get rid of the negative ones. If you got a negative Nancy or a bummer Brian in your life, move on. Life is hard enough. There are realities you're going to face. Everything isn't sunshine, rainbows, and unicorns. But everything isn't dark, doldrums, cloudy, and the world is ending. Manage your psyche by managing those who you hang with. You are what your environment puts you through. If you're in the basement playing video games with all of the long-haired freaky people, you're going to continue to be a long-haired freaky people. I like video games. It was the We had video arcades growing up. You could go in with $5 worth of quarters and play all day. Now it's at your fingertips. Unfortunately, lots of bad things at your fingertips. What you can find, what your children can find online in seconds is disgusting. Manage that. Don't coddle. Minimize the game time. Minimize the screen time. Go out and meet people. The next thing they said is nurture your casual relationships. That means talk to the postman. Again, I don't get all this right. I just throw ideas out. We give gift cards to our garbage uh, person, our um, recycling person, the trucks. We walk out, give them gift cards every year around the holidays for Christmas. It's important to us. They do very important work for us. What would I do with all my garbage if I had to stack it up in the backyard all year? These people do wonders for us. Give gift cards. We also give it to the Amazon driver, the post lady, and the FedEx lady. And it took me a couple extra weeks to catch the FedEx lady. I was walking my dog in the neighborhood. The FedEx lady stops because she likes my dog, hops out, hands a dog treat to the dog. And she goes, I just love your dog. It's so, so nice. And I said, well, it's good to see you again. We've been looking for you for, um, since the holidays. This is like January 30th. I mean, it's like 30 days after the holiday season. And I go, I have something for you. And she goes, well, hop on. I'll give you a ride back. First of all, I know she was breaking company protocol. Her name is to be protected because I knew that was a no-no. And I said, I'm not going to do that. I know you aren't supposed to do that. She goes, oh, it's just 100 yards. I said, just walk up there. She goes, I got three more deliveries on your cul-de-sac. I'll come up and see you. I go in, come out with a gift card. She starts crying. So what are you crying for? She goes, you have no idea what this means to me. I said, it's a $25 gift card. 
She goes, you have no idea what this means to me. It's not about the amount. It's that you care. I'm not looking for kudos there, but it was about the relationship. And she went over and waved to my wife through the window. She was sitting in the office. My wife waves back. She was on a conference call, so she couldn't come out. And she goes, I hope your wife doesn't mind, but I'm a hugger and grabs a hold of me and hugs me like we haven't seen each other and we're family, like, I, like she's been on deployment and just gotten home. And she goes, you have no idea how happy this makes me. Have a blessed day. Man, did I feel awesome. Man, did she feel awesome. Nurture those casual relationships. Talk to the crossing guard where your kids are at school. Talk to the security guard at your, at your business if you go in today or tomorrow. Next step, make time for conversations. University of Kansas study, talking and people that engage in conversations, not via text, not via video screens, but engage with other people and have conversations, have a happier life. It's called cultivate kindness. It's, a, it's about talking with people. The Kansas study was about the talking and the conversations. It's a Michigan State University study. They looked at 2,500 couples, happily married couples, and their feedback was cultivate kindness. Be conscientious. Be conscientious. Be agreeable. Be stable. You know what stability comes from? Hard work. Core values. Focus. Expectations of yourself and your loved ones. That's where stability comes from. The next thing the study said was volunteer. And by the way, this, um, not the next study, this article was in the Harvard Business Review. Again, I've said it before, great, great periodical. Volunteer. You meet more people. We talked about giving a few weeks ago. I brought up volunteering then. It fills your heart with joy. It makes you feel good about yourself. You don't do it for yourself. You're doing it to help others. But the positive um, collateral outcome is you feel joy in your heart. Get those people that are living in your basement that are your children's, your loved ones, or whatever, and if they aren't handing out resumes by the dozen per week, I guarantee they can get a job in a week if they tried. Help them put their resume together, get them out there. If they aren't on interviews that day, have them go volunteer somewhere. Have them give back somewhere. Put them in the yard and get it mowed. Shovel the walk. Make home uncomfortable. They will find a way. Learn to apologize. I made a big mistake this week. I have a person I've known in my business life for years. I work with her, and um, her team and my team are having some struggles, and they've been going on for quite some time, and it just pops up now and then, and I was having a bad day. And this just proves that I need to have these conversations with myself every day too. And I had another situation come up, and uh, I instant messaged, uh, or she had reached out on something that she needed help with something, and I went after her on this problem that was going on. I was on another call. I had a situation where I was preparing for a meeting with Japan that night. My stress levels were high. I should have stood up, walked away, used my own advice. I made a mistake, and I made it about going after her a little bit. Now, the points I were making were true. My approach was not good. So the next thing the Harvard Business Review said about cultivating relationships and bringing happiness to yourself is learn to apologize. I didn't sleep that night. I've known this young lady for 20 years. We are friends. We helped each other through divorces. There's been tears on shoulders at meetings. I called her the next day and, hey, how you doing? How you doing? And I said, I just, uh, I owe you a, a tremendously large apology. And she goes, that means so much. We're good. And we moved on, working on solving the problems together. We've had better communication in the last 36 hours than those two teams have together in a long time. And we sat there for 30 minutes and said, we are going to lead this problem out of the organization. But it took me making a very bad mistake, leadership mistake, individual relationship mistake. I realized it. It's okay. We all make mistakes, right? How do you not make mistakes through experience? How do you gain experience by making mistakes? I made a mistake but I knew I needed to apologize. I called her boss and I apologized to him. It will not happen again. So be willing to apologize. The other thing they says, ask questions about others. You know why? People love to talk about themselves. Two ears and one mouth. 
Use them in proportion. Listen, ask people, how's their day going? And really mean it. What have you been up to? Really mean it. We have all these off-the-cuff comments that just become fodder and time fillers and air suckers. Say it and mean it. Get down with your kids if they're in the basement. Get down with your uh, nephew when you're, uh, you see him the next time that's living at home and doesn't seem to be motivated and start looking for the why. What have you been up to? How are the job interviews going? Well, I'm not really interviewing right now. Why not? You know how good it feels to get a paycheck? You know how good it feels to have your own place? You know how good it feels to develop, to develop relationships, to be successful? Do you know how good it feels to be self-sufficient? And the last two things they say is express love and be vulnerable. If you love somebody, tell them. If you aren't doing something right, be vulnerable. Lean into relationships. We together can get 7 million people out of the basement. We together can get 11 million jobs filled. We together can bring our society back to optimism. Quit hating the country because of something that happened 275 years ago. Quit hating the country because you feel you've been wronged and you want to play victimhood all over. I don't care your color or your creed or your background. Be uplifting. You yourself are responsible for your happiness. Bad things have happened. Bad things will happen. We work as it, at it as a society, continuously improve. That's what's wonderful about this country is we have improved it, improved it, improved it, improved it. That'll continue on till the end of time, which is not coming in 10 years. Go out and be those people that strive to improve the village. And the reason I know we're going to be successful with you all doing that is because you're all awesome. Keep that shit up. Talk next week. <laughs> <laughs>